Okay. Hello, and welcome to Strategies for Long-Term Management of Recurrent Ovarian Cancer. My name is Savannah Shine, and I'm the Ovarian Cancer Program Director at SHARE. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Roshino Carroll is a medical oncologist working at Memorial Sloan Kettering. She did an advanced oncology fellowship at MSKCC and has been attending there for the past six years on the Gynecologic Medical Oncology Service. She's also an assistant professor at Weill Cornell Medical College. Her research focuses on developing targeted and immune-based therapies for patients with gynecologic cancers. Dr. O'Carroll, thank you for being with us today. Hi, thanks very much, and I'm delighted to be able to present some exciting new um, developments in um, the management of uh, recurrent ovarian cancer. So I'm just going to firstly discuss the prevalence of this cancer. Um, so although it's not the most common cancer, um, endometrial being the most common GYN cancer in the U.S., ovarian cancer does account for um, 22,000 new um, cases each year. And a lot of work has been done to try and develop new strategies to deal with this um, cancer as frequently patients um, uh, develop recurrent disease. And so we're trying to improve the long-term outcomes for our patients. And there has been a lot of work through targeted therapies, PARP inhibitors, and also more recently immunotherapies. So the median survival continues to improve. We've had excellent advances in surgery. And as I said, then also our treatment options continue to improve. As we all know, um, ovarian cancer isn't just as simple as um, one disease. It can be a whole host of different diseases. So there's a lot of different histologies, such as clear cell. The most common type when we're talking about ovarian cancer, we're usually talking about high-grade serous ovarian cancer. Um, and we now understand that it's most likely that these cancers start actually in the fallopian tubes rather than the ovary itself. So some abnormal cells, like uh, abnormalities occur in the cells in the fallopian tube, and then these um, abnormal cells spread to the ovary where they implant and are able to grow. So we frequently now understand that a lot of these cancers actually start in the fallopian tube. Um, depending on the different type, um, so the high-grade serous starts in the fallopian tube and is associated with BRCA1 and 2 mutations. Um, we frequently see for the low-grade serous, we think that these possibly start in inclusion cysts, um, and we sometimes see mutations in genes called BRAF or KRAF. And then the clear cell, which is quite a rare type of cancer, we feel that these m mainly start in the setting of endometriosis, um, and these can be associated rarely with Lynch syndrome, and there are other particular mutations. So a lot of energy has been made into trying to target new types of therapies according to the, the type of ovarian cancer. And then one of the rarest is the um, mucinous tumors, and often we see this associated with KRAS. And these mucinous carcinomas behave almost like a, a colon cancer. So frequently, depending on the type of cancer, we see that um, for the most common high-grade serous that it tends to present at an advanced stage, but it does tend to be quite chemosensitive. But then there's other tumors, like their low-grade serous. They tend to also present at a high stage, but chemo doesn't work as well. And there's been a lot of development, in particular, with things like MEK inhibitors, and more recently now using hormone manipulation to try and target these. And these have been shown to be perhaps more effective strategies, although, unfortunately, the data for the MEK inhibitors um, hasn't been proven to be very strong yet. So a lot of work is, is going into that. And then the other rarer tumors, often they present at an early stage. Again, our traditional chemotherapies don't work as well, so there's a lot of work into trying to develop um, strategies that will work. And this is another way of looking at it. So we understand that usually cancer starts because of mistakes in the gene, and, and those genetic mutations can be particular to different types of cancer. So we know that there's often um, inactivation of important genes called the BRCA genes, BRCA1 and 2, and that's frequently seen up to about 15% of patients with high-grade serous ovarian cancer have and genetically inherited a mutation from their parents, or we can see actually in the cancer itself that those genes may not be working due to mutations. Um, and the same, d depending on the different types, the rarer tumors, there are certain um, characteristic mutations that we see in the genes. 
one of the most common mutations that we see is this p53 but unfortunately at this time we haven't developed a targeted strategy that works in that type of tumor but hope there's a lot of work also going into this because this is one of the most common mutations seen across a whole load of different what we call solid tumors or other different types of cancers so um, hopefully in the future we will be able to develop a strategy to target that um, gene mutation so there's we've really got a, a lot of um, insight into a whole host of different mechanisms that can um, cause cancer and then also can cause the cancer to recur and in fact to metastasize and grow and so there are loads of different ways and that we can think about how best to target cancer and maybe even to use a few of them together to combine different approaches and um, so for example the PARP inhibitors has been very important in ovarian cancer and they target the BRCA um, and then there's the VEGF, so that's bevacizumab or, or drugs like that that can block new blood vessel growth into tumors. And there's a whole host of different um, areas and different potential targets that we, we can use. And, and we try our best to develop a strategy for each of these individual um, areas and then figure out how best to combine um, treatments together. So for example, sometimes we give chemotherapy with bevacizumab or sometimes we give a drug um, a chemo drug that we know causes DNA damage with a PARP inhibitor to get the best effect. And then a newer approach is, is the immunotherapy, so there's been a lot of work in that area as well. So there are, there's been a, a push to develop um, non-chemotherapy options for patients or targeted therapies. So there's all those drugs that I just mentioned, the PARP inhibitors targeting the, the BRCA um, mutations, um, and then there's the blood, the Anti angiogenesis inhibitors, they target um, new blood vessel growth to the tumors. We have the immunotherapy such as ipilimumab and nivolumab. Although these are really exciting treatments, they do have the potential for quite significant side effects. So they're not exactly benign treatments and we have a lot to learn um, with, in regards to these. The response rates are about between 10 to 17 percent in ovarian cancer as single agents. And then for our low-grade serous tumors, there's been work in developing MEK inhibitors and also um, um, taking from the breast cancer um, patients, we've tried to figure out um, if there is a role for hormone manipulation and there has been um, in the setting of low-grade serous ovarian tumors. Perhaps even up to 30% of uh, ovarian cancer cases may be associated with a hereditary um, cancer syndrome. So there has been a lot of effort to try and figure out who these women are and also to develop um, effectment screening strategies for them and then for women who ha have developed cancer to try and perhaps target um, the, um, the pathway or the, that caused the, um, the cancer to develop such as the, the PARP inhibitors. Um, in terms of BRCA, um, we, as I said, um, the recommendation is to um, have germline testing for patients who have an ovarian cancer. And the lifetime risk for somebody who carries a mutated gene is up to 50%. And the huge thing that I think will make a, a big difference for patients and their families is what we call cascade testing. So that's where a, lady, a, a woman is diagnosed with ovarian cancer, she undergoes BRCA testing, and if found to be positive, then she informs her asymptomatic blood relatives, um, who then themselves can get tested and potentially um, undergo um, risk-reducing surgery or, or um, make changes and obviously follow up with a specialist, um, things such as the oral contraceptive pill in um, young women that can reduce the risk of them developing ovarian cancer. Um, and then if somebody knows that they're BRCA positive, this is considerations for the timing of when they'll have their children, whether or not they would want to undergo an elective risk-reducing um, surgery where you remove the ovaries and the uterus. And then in, in women with high risk, um, who are at high risk for developing ovarian cancer, although we all know that ovarian, unfortunately there's no screening for um, the general population for ovarian cancer, despite the big efforts that have been done to, to find an effective screen, there is not an effective screening method for ovarian cancer. But in the setting of clinical trials and in specialist centers, 
now we have these screening programs for high-risk women who perhaps know that they carry the a BRCA1 or 2 gene or a Lynch-associated Lynch gene. So the PARP inhibitors are now FDA approved um, since 2014 and that you have a BRCA mutation who have recurrent ovarian cancer and who've undergone three different types of, of chemotherapy. Um, and this, these type of drugs are being developed um, for patients with newly diagnosed in, in a maintenance setting, for patients um, who have received um, less prior treatments. There's a lot of different um, drugs in this uh, being developed. And the whole idea behind the PARP inhibitors is that, in general, the tumor is missing, a, um, or the, the patient is missing one functioning copy of the BRCA gene, and then another mistake happens so that they're they, um, the two genes are, are no longer functioning. So what the PARP inhibitors do is they target another cancer, cancer re repair or another um, cell repair mechanism so that they're particularly lethal for the cancer cell because the cancer cell has no way to repair itself if another mistake happens. And so these really have been um, quite a promising um, approach and are, are just a, another addition to our armamentarium against um, ovarian cancer. And one of my particular interests is in terms of harnessing the power of the immune system. How can we use the immune system to attack the cancer? So we know, for example, in terms of infections or viral infections, that the immune system recognizes the virus as foreign and then is able to attack it and develop immunity against it. So there's been a lot of effort by numerous groups um, throughout the world in trying to develop treatments that would be able to teach our own immune system mm -hmm. to attack and recognize the cancer as foreign and then to attack and, and eradicate it. And this, there has been great excitement in this type of approach and there's been huge successes and, and life-changing successes for patients, for example, with melanoma. And so the hope is that we can develop an effective strategy that would also work for, for women with um, ovarian cancer. We know from research that um, when there is a lot, when there are, is a, a, a lot of inflammation, so these little brown cells here, when there are a lot of these presents within tumors, that there is a benefit from using an immunotherapy approach. Um, and then often we see that in tumors where there really is no immune response, that the immunotherapy is not going to be very effective. But the big question is, how can we change this type of tumor into this type of tumor? Where that we, where how can we modify the environment of the tumor and make it more likely that our immunotherapy approaches would work? Unfortunately, a lot of these um, strategies are still in their infancy, and we're still trying to figure out which women will benefit. The response rates of, for example, of nivolumab would be of the order of about 12 to 15 percent, and but for some patients, it can be. Um, you know, you think they can get very, very prolonged response and excellent outcomes with this type of approach, but it definitely doesn't work for all women, and that's why there's a lot of work ongoing to try and figure out which women um, would be most likely to benefit. And for those who are not, is there a way that we can change their tumor so that they are more likely to respond? Another area that I'm interested in is in using a type of technology that we're using in leukemias. It's called CAR T cell. Um, technology, and what that is is it's t it's using a patient's own T cells, genetically modifying them, and trying to get them to. And when we infuse them back to the patient, having tried to genetically modify them to target um, a marker on the surface of of the ovarian cancer cell. So, um, we are currently conducting a phase one trial, um, targeting MUC16, which is the retained bit of. CA125, which is a tumor marker we frequently follow in ovarian cancer. So we're using the bit that stays on the ovarian cancer cell surface. And what we're doing is we're taking off a patient's own T cells, genetically modifying it, and then um, reinfusing it back into the patient with the hope that the here's our ovarian cancer cell, that the our CAR T cells will be able to see the target and then also um, eradicate the tumor. So this is a, a very high-risk strategy. This is type of treatment is given in the intensive care unit, and there is a very high risk of possible side effects. But the more we learn about this type of approach, the more hopefully we'll be able to develop a very safe approach and maybe even an effective long-term approach for patients. But as I said, this is 
very, very early stages of development. A question I frequently get asked is about, well, what about further surgery? I had excellent results with my primary debulking surgery. What about when should I consider doing another surgery? Um, and so we often try to think about, you know, how long was somebody in remission? So, for example, if they've had a very long remission, then definitely surgery would be um, a consideration if they're otherwise well. The goal of any surgery should be to try and get the minimal amount of residual disease at the end of the surgery so that the surgeon really is able to have removed all the residual disease if at all possible. So if a cancer comes back within a very short time frame, for example, less than six months, we would not um, recommend doing um, surgery in that um, situation. If it's between the six to 12 month um, time frame, then sometimes we would consider it, especially for example, if there's just one side of disease. But the longer the disease-free interval, and if there were, um, especially if the patient um, had good chemotherapy options, because definitely chemo has to be combined with um, any kind of secondary or tertiary surgery, we would definitely um, consider referral to our surgeon to see if surgery is an option. But the, the goal of surgery should be, you know, um, uh, complete gross residual disease if at all possible. There is no benefit if we leave a lot of tumor behind because then, as we all know, that can delay um, further chemotherapy. Um, and of course, any surgery, there's risks associated with it. So it's always a very important discussion between the patient and her, their surgeon and their uh, and medical oncologist. So one question I also get is, well, there's so many different chemo choices. How do I decide which is best for me now? Um, and then what I try and do is it depends what's going on um, with the patient, if there's any important life event, for example, a drug like liposomal doxorubicin is just once every four weeks. In general, it's very well tolerated. Um, a drug like Taxol is an excellent drug, but of course it can cause this hair loss and it can cause neuropathy. So when we're trying to figure out which drug we should do at which stage, it depends um, what type of other side effects the patients may have and where they are in their disease course, um, how frequent they can come in, um, and, and what the goal, any other side effects that they've um, from other diseases that they may have. And so there are a lot of different options and it's trying to choose the, the right sequence of these that will best fit the patient. And also I would also try and think about what future trial options might be available. So if we know, for example, there's a, um, a second line um, trial option with um, liposomal doxorubicin, then maybe we would choose um, gemcitabine or something like that so that that trial option would remain um, there for the future. One other question I frequently get asked is regarding um, herbal supplements, and I am all. I think it's very important to follow a, a healthy, balanced diet, um, and we have developed an excellent um, app, and, and it's available um, on our MSK website where you can search any herb um, at all, and you put in the name, and then it will give you, you know, what. What this drug is, or what this herb is meant to do, and then also what the potential side effects are, because not all treatments, just because they're natural, are benign. For example, Taxol, which we all know causes neuropathy and hair loss, that is actually derived from the bark of a yew tree. So I try and um, convey that these tr herbal treatments, although they really sound like a, a, a natural treatment, that they may be a great, op great option. It's really important to discuss them with a, um, a trained physician who would be able to guide you in terms of determining whether or not they would be the right choice for you. Some of these um, medicines can interfere with the, the liver. Others can increase risk of bleeding, increase risk of blood clots. Some of them actually promote um, estrogen, so they're like pro-estrogenic and obviously in ovarian cancer, which is a hormone sensitive tumor, sometimes that's not something that a patient would want to, to take. And um, so it, it's important to think about those kind of things um, before starting any, any supplements. I think another thing that is very important is to listen to what, what patients um, and, and cancer survivors and um, what their biggest um, health issues and concerns are. And often side effects really predominate um, the biggest uh, 
impairment of quality of life, with fatigue being a very predominant issue, sleep disturbance. So, for example, at Memorial Sloan Kettering, we now have a, a trial looking at patients, cancer survivors, and um, looking at a program of acupuncture for insomnia versus cognitive behavioral therapy to try and improve um, um, sleep disturbance um, in cancer survivors. Another important thing is urinary dysfunction, which really can cause a lot of, it really impairs somebody's quality of life. And then very important and often we neglect is issues regarding sexuality and dysfunction and intimacy issues. So in our own center we had asked uh, female cancer patients and survivors in a general outpatient clinic, how concerned are you about se sexual activity, vaginal health? And 73% of patients were between somewhat to very concerned. Um, it's interesting that given that a number of patients, our own research shows that only 20% of, of women actually go on to seek professional um, guidance in this area. Um, and we have a, a female sexual medicine and women's health program at MSKCC. Um, and when we polled the patients attending and cancer survivors attending um, that program, 93% of women were concerned with vaginal health and, and sexual activity. Some of the symptoms are vaginal dryness, pain, loss of um, desire, libido, um, and arousal difficulties. Although research shows that the importance of sexuality varies for women, I think one thing that is, is uniform is that vulvar and vaginal health are important for all women. And so often simple things like vaginal moisturizers, which do need to be um, applied consistently, um, can really help in terms of vaginal dryness and, and really improve the quality of life um, for cancer survivors. Um, during intercourse, a vaginal lubricant would be recommended for both partners um, and often a liquid or gel to reduce pain with um, sexual activity. And water-based lubricants are usually what we would recommend. In terms of vaginal moisturizers, and these should be applied to the vagina regularly to assist in hydrating the vaginal tissues. Um, and that could really improve um, comfort levels um, for women. There are non-hormonal types of vaginal moisturizers, such as Replens, Hyalogen, KY liquid beads can, that women often find very helpful. And don't forget they can also be applied to the vulvar, vestibular, and the clitoral area as well, because often these areas often um, have associated symptoms related to to dryness. And then another thing that's important is um, a lot of women wear a, a liner or a pad, so not to forget to apply um, a sealant that really would dramatically um, improve irritation um, related to wearing a, a liner or a pad, such as Aquaphor, Balmex, or Decetin. Pelvic floor exercises are, are, can be very important. A lot of um, women experience issues in terms of urinary incontinence and um, having leakage. So it has been shown that by doing relaxation and trying to better control the pelvic floor muscles that, I, that I can actually help with not only sexual intercourse and, pel and pelvic exams and also, of course, um, urinary incontinence. Um, and there are rehabilitation programs using physical therapy that really can greatly assist with any issues um, associated with um, pelvic floor weakness. Often um, simple things like diet modification in the setting of if somebody has diarrhea or if their stomach is irritated, nausea, there are certain modifications for that during those times that you can make that really could improve your, your quality of life as well. So avoiding very spicy foods, for example, in, in the setting of heartburn or avoiding milk in the setting of diarrhea, those, those kind of strategies. And often in the... Uh, there's a nutritionist associated with your um, doctor's practice and, and sometimes they can come up with helpful hints that may um, help guide you in terms of what choices in, um, uh, for diet. And I borrowed this from last year's presentation. This was an excellent um, slide put together, together by Annie Ellis and this shows the, the large um, number of different resources that are available um, to patients. Um, and all of these links have a huge abundance of, um, of uh, help and, and it's so important to have the support um, 
from other people and from knowing other women are going through the same kind of thing at the same time and, and learning from their experience. And also it helps um, physicians for us to know what is important for cancer survivors and for patients so that we can better listen and um, better devise treatment strategies and effective long-term ones that will help our, our patients. Um, and this has led to a lot of different efforts. For example, at our own center, we have an ovarian cancer conference coming um, next month where we're trying to get all these experts together to try and um, educate each other and also maybe discuss new opportunities for, for research and improved um, strategies to enable our um, beloved patients to um, live for as long as possible with the best quality of life. So I'm um, happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. O'Carroll. Um, that was a fabulous presentation. We are just collecting our questions here, and I'm going to pass this over to Andrea in just a moment. Um, and she will start questions. First, I, I, I have to uh, thank Dr. O'Carroll for such a wide range and clear and uh, high level discussion. You know, uh, a lot of the women that are listening in have asked quite excellent questions uh, based on their experience uh, thus far, uh, and they range from the general to the specific. Um, somebody was wondering, you know, a lot of these women that are dealing with recurrence, sometimes a recurrence can be as devastating, if not more, than the initial diagnosis, and you as a, one of our heroines in the field, uh, you know, I'm sure are very familiar uh, with the emotional impact. Uh, questions along those lines are, what are the consequences of taking a break from uh, chemo? Uh, and, uh, you know, as people, you know, come to grips with the fact that they're going to be in treatment or it may be treated as a chronic illness. Um, so I absolutely agree um, with what you said. I mean, it, it is very, I, I often find that it is, the diagnosis of recurrence can be more devastating. Um, and it's a, a big um, change in type of outlook because it now is clearly a chronic disease. But the thing that we always try and make clear is it's a very treatable chronic disease and we have so many different treatment options. So there's a lot of hope even in the setting of recurrent. But, you know, that's, I think a lot of um, people come to accept that over time, but initially it's extremely daunting at the time of being diagnosed with recurrent disease. In terms of taking a chemo break, I think that's always a great idea. I think, unfortunately, the ovarian cancer has to fit into your life, um, but it's important that the you know that patients go on living um, because that's what this is about is is trying to develop effective strategies so that patients can live with their ovarian cancer so for example if there's important events happening we always try and work the chemotherapy around that in terms of taking prolonged breaks the concern is you know whether or not the ovarian cancer will cause symptoms that will impair quality of life so trying to get that balance right between if there are are no symptoms related to the cancer, then definitely an ovarian, a, a chemo break sounds like a, a very reasonable option. Of course, that would be discussed, the patient would discuss that carefully with their medical oncologist. But if there, if somebody's having a lot of symptoms related to the cancer, that may not be the time to, to take any kind of prolonged chemo break. But I think it's really important to discuss li important life events with your oncologist so that then they can make sure that they know about those and, and work their treatments around it because there are a lot of different choices and we really try hard if we know about these important events to, to work around them to make sure that you're able to live your life to a maximum. Thank you, Dr. O'Carroll. Now we have some questions that are about uh, clinical trials and they're wondering if you have anything, any input on uh, clinical trials uh, that are considered maintenance uh, therapy and also another question which is related, which is, uh, can you be considered for a clinical trial uh, without measurable disease? Um, so they're exactly both very related questions. So I think this, the last one is met without measurable disease is sometimes that patient would fit into the, what we call the remission population, and there are remission trials, all right. So remission means that, that you feel well, that the, you see a 125 is normal, and, and the scan looks more or less normal as well, that there's no 
definitive evidence of cancer. And some trials, for example, even if the scan is, doesn't show measurable disease, it may be possible to go on a trial with a, an elevated CA125. It depends on the wording of the trial. And the reason for that is that ultimately if you're doing a trial and, and you're potentially taking a, an investigational drug that could have side effects, you know, the investigators want to make sure that it, that they will be able to measure whether or not their drug is working and, and helping you. So if you don't have measurable disease on the, on the scan, it's possible that even without treatment um, that that would have remained um, stable. Um, and so that's often the requirement for needing measurable diseases so that it can be that the investigators or the, um, the research people can check to make sure that the drug is actually helping. And, Thank sorry, you. Sorry. and there's PARP inhibitor remission, uh, remission trials or maintenance trials, and there are drugs with uh, trials with drugs such as sidirinib. Um, there are a lot of different um, trials, but often, for example, at each center, they will try just to have one trial, one or two trials for each specific area. So, for example, a trial for newly diagnosed patients, a trial for first remission, a trial for second or greater remission, a trial for platinum sensitive patients, a trial for platinum resistant, but not to have too many competing trials at once. Well, uh, the next group of questions I was going to ask you actually had to do with PARP inhibitors and genetic testing. And um, I think you did just answer, but somebody wanted you to elaborate on the role and patient access to PARP inhibitor for maintenance after first platinum sensitive recurrence uh, and you know, being BRCA positive. So um, there are, so there is a trial, a GOG trial, it's, it's for patients with recurrent disease who, so they, it would have to be the first or greater recurrence. Um, and it's a trial of chemo, olaparib, or olaparib and sidirinib. Sidirinib is an anti-blood vessel blocker or a type of bevacizumab approach. That is for patients who have measurable disease. There is another trial for patients who are newly diagnosed. It's called a Tesaro study, and that is with a PARP inhibitor called norepinerib. And that is only for patients who are BRCA positive. The current, are, are their tumors behave as if there's a, a BRCA mutation? And then um, the current FDA um, uh, licensing or approval for Olaparib is for BRCA patients, BRCA positive patients who um, have had three different types of prior chemotherapy. So I think for the scenario that you described, it would have to be currently in the setting of a clinical trial. Yes, thank you very much for that uh, very thorough answer. And um, we did have a question about going back, backtracking to genetic testing. And uh, this uh, registrant wants to know if, if someone is not BRCA positive, is it necessary to undergo genetic testing? I think women are hearing more and more about wider panels, and uh, that, may, that may be why she asked this question. That's a great question. And what I would recommend is seeing a genetic counselor and determining whether or not that would be a good idea. Um, also, there are some limitations in terms of um, insurance coverage. Thankfully, in New York, the coverage has really dramatically improved, and a lot of women now have access to these broader panels. So it would be just, I, what I would recommend is definitely seeing a genetic counselor who will carefully look at your family history, look at any testing you've already had done, and then they may be able to determine whether or not a broader panel would make sense in, in your individual case. Thank you. I, I see, you know, there were general questions on immunotherapy, which I really do think you addressed in your presentation. So I'm going to go right to ones uh, that are uh, grouped around uh, the use of metformin and um, uh, thoughts on managing blood pressure that develops during treatments and thoughts on prediabetes as helping cancer growth. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of Metformin, so some of the, for example, the endometrioid type tumors, we think that maybe they do arise in the environment where there is um, dysregulation of uh, what we call glucose impaired glucose tolerance, or often their um, patients may be a little bit overweight, and those kind of, that environment may um, increase the, the hormone levels within the body that may potentially um, lead to an environment where 
ongoing cancer growth is possible. So things that patients can do, I always recommend healthy lifestyle and regular exercise is so good and it's a very effective long-term strategy and um, it's very, very important. Things like metformin, they can cause rare side effects such as um, lactic acidosis or um, diarrhea. Um, so those kind of things, it would be a discussion between your medical oncologist and your in internist. If you, if somebody has prediabetes, something like metformin absolutely might make sense. But for somebody who's not um, in the pre-diabetic range, there really isn't strong evidence to support the use of metformin at the moment. But it's really looking at um, and talking to your, your medical oncologist and your um, internist about whether or not metformin would be the correct option in terms of treating a, a pre-diabetes. In terms of blood pressure, I think that's so important, um, especially with the drugs such as bevacizumab or um, some of the sidirinib, those type of drugs, the blood vessel blocker drugs. I always try and ask my patients to get a blood pressure cuff and check their blood pressure at home because what we see is that blood pressure can rise really quickly and untreated blood pressure is a really big deal and can cause um, life-threatening side effects such as stroke, bleeding, things like that. So it's really important that we monitor the blood pressure and treat it aggressively if it does go up. In the case of bevacizumab, about a third of patients who were not on a blood pressure pill would have to start one, and of those who were already on an anti-blood pressure medicine, about a third would need to add in at least another one. Oh, thank you. Um, you know, we're so heartened to see that there are many long-term survivors out there, and some of them would appreciate your thoughts on long-term survivorship, anything that you're hearing or reading about, about uh, you know, how, um, how that's going and uh, long-term maybe effects of treatment, and also any lifestyle. I think you've addressed this with your discussion on exercise and diet, but um, if there's any more thoughts that you have on uh, how long-term survivors can uh, navigate the world. Yeah, well, as you said, I think there's such great um, energy and, you know, um, patients themselves are, are really, you know, doing their research and um, seeking out other um, advocates. Um, and I, I suppose a, a common theme that I would see amongst the long-term cancer survivors is, you know, um, a, an amazing, a phenomenal resilience. Um, and ongoing efforts to work the ovarian cancer within their life, but looking at clinical trial choices and seeing if at that time, you know, every time there's a change in treatment, seeing if that's the right choice for them at that moment in time. And then trying to do everything they can to minimize side effects during treatment, talking, keeping very close contact with um, their team to try and, and minimize toxicities. Because something like neuropathy could, you know, can be lifelong and can be devastating. So simple things like strategies like acupuncture or um, trying vitamin B6, things like that are small little strategies that can work very well for, for some women. Um, so And things like integrative medicine, Pilates, yoga. Um, but I, I think it's important as well to, to say that some of the drivers behind um, the cancer is, is the biology of the, the tumor. And I suppose that's what we're trying to do is develop strategies to target that. But some women are very unfortunate in that their cancer develops very quickly, and that's nothing to do with them not having a positive mental attitude or anything like that. It, it tends to be the nature of the disease. But I, I would say for everyone in life, it's always best to have a, a good um, positive outcome as best one can because it, it definitely helps with the bumps in the road um, as one goes on. Thank you. You know, one of our uh, survivors out in Cyberland uh, notes that it's hard to exercise regularly with low blood counts, and uh, I recall that. I used to just try to walk my best, uh, mm -hmm. and I even took some water aerobics, but, you know, you got to do the best you can. Isn't that right, Doctor? Oh, absolutely. I feel under pressure, you know, to, I think the common sense approach always has to apply, and if somebody can't exercise, but there are small little things that you can do, even, you know, sitting in the chair, moving around, uh, you, very good breathing exercises with yoga, Pilates, those kind of things. I, I think it's just important that we make a conscious effort to include exercise because we're so busy with all the other things going on, but sometimes I see exercise as being you know, a very important addition. And the more you do, the more you're able to do. The less you do, the less you're able to do. And, and it just um, it, it does help with that resilience, if at all possible. But of course, it, that's not always possible. And somebody 
is feeling very nauseated, I think it would be essential to deal with that first before um, you know, being focused on, for example, exercising. Oh, thank you for that answer. And, and finally, we have a couple of questions. Uh, one is uh, the best online resource for finding a compilation of clin clinical trials. Um, you know, we do know about clinicaltrials.gov and on the SHARE website we do have uh, an emerging med that hel helps you find clinical trials, but maybe you have thoughts about that. Uh, well, I thought your, yeah, I really liked your, um, my clinicaltrials.gov is what I would go to, and there is a lot of work, for example, at MSK, they're trying to develop search engines to make it easier to search, because it is very tricky and you have to know what the right keywords to put in. I think something like the resource on your SHARE website is, is excellent and very helpful. Um, but I do know that there's a lot of work trying to develop um, patient-focused um, search engines to, to really help people. I would suggest contacting, you know, the major cancer centers or your local one or talking to your own oncologist about what clinical trial options and just not to forget about those at every time that you're making a, a, a treatment decision. But um, most oncologists are aware that of the the various clinical trial options, and if, if they don't know what's available in their own area, they could definitely um, put you in touch with the people who, who would. And we have somebody who wants to know if the conference on October 6th is open to the public. It's mainly directed at scienti and scientists and clinicians and nursing staff, and there is definitely a lot of the advocacy groups are very welcome to attend, but it's it's more so um, at the scientific sharing of data, and then the hope is from those kind of um, this kind of conference that maybe then we'd be able to um, share this with um, with groups uh, like share, <laughs> um, <laughs> but but at a later date. So it, it's more a sharing of scientific data rather than necessarily um, open to the public. And now, finally, we have some, you know, it's common for people to unfortunately have, you know, uh, uh, blockages and uh, constipation. And somebody was wondering, and this is something that is very worrisome for a lot of people who live in uh, just, you know, their whole day is changed by that uh, CA125, um, a spike with no symptoms, can the spike be due to an IBS crisis or, you know, other factors, inflammation? Well, every time, I mean, I always say I will, I never treat the CA125, I'm always treating the individual because that's so important. So it's what's going on with the, the individual. So if um, a woman is, you know, has a lot of symptoms and her CA125 is normal, I would be more alarmed in that setting than, for example, a, a sudden rise in a, a blip in a CA125 because there are a lot of things that can influence that. So, of course, we don't ignore it. But we always think about, you know, treating the patient, treating the survivor, not not treating the number. And I think it's important that the CA125 is a, as a marker, but um, it shouldn't determine somebody's, uh, you know, what they're going to do for the day. It, it's it's part of the cancer journey, and it's a very difficult and very um, stress and anxiety provoking um, test results. Um, but definitely, we follow them. But it doesn't necessary mean that something has to be done straight away. Okay, well I think we've answered all the questions we have. We'll give our uh, registrants a minute or two to type in if there's anything else out there, but this gives me the option, uh, the time, to say to you that, uh, you know, you are just uh, the Marvel hero, uh, universe is missing a heroine and you're, you're one of them. You and your uh, going on colleagues. Uh, we're so appreciative of your time today. Oh, another question came in. Uh, experience with patients developing IBS after surgery and chemotherapy. That's extremely common. And, and thankfully with our GI colleagues, there's actually a lot of new drugs out there now um, that they're developing, So especially for the IBS type symptoms. So I would definitely set up an appointment with the gastroenterologist or ask your oncologist regarding that because um, there are a lot of new medications now in the market that do seem to be quite effective. Often simple strategies like keeping a food diary um, to see if there's any triggers and things like peppermint tea, ginger for nausea, um, exercise, simple strategies like that. But often I do see that patients can identify if they keep a food diary, event, identify what the triggers are and they know their body's best and they can often figure out a, a regimen or they know, for example, I shouldn't have taken that spinach or whatever and they know exactly what, what triggered it. One thing I definitely um, notice 
uh, associated with a lot of GI things is kale, which I know is included in all the kind of juicing and smoothies and stuff like that. But if you're anyway prone to um, IBS type symptoms, I would definitely stay away from the kale. Okay, um, and um, my colleague uh, has uh, noted that when she was talking about our fear of recurrence uh, program, that it is actually on Thursday, October 6th, the same day that you will be meeting with your colleagues about the latest, from 12.30 to 1.30 Eastern Standard Time. And it's a webinar as well. Um, I, uh, oh, we got, we got some other questions about kale coming in now. <laughs> <laughs> what does kale do? Specifically, why kale? I love kale. I mean, we, I mean, kale and, sh and chard are just so healthy. And I think that, you know, from what I know, it's the calcium, but uh, go ahead. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it can just, it's the gas that it can in increase it really. Some people seem super sensitive. Oh, so okay. It, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would, it, it's certain people, they know who <laughs> they are. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, that was my first question is, did you have kale yesterday? And it, or, or spinach, kale and spinach and Brussels sprouts, they're the... The big, the big triggers. You know, somebody's asking a question that I now understand. Uh, I didn't when I first saw it, and I understand it because I'm a 20-year survivor who had to have a CAT scan uh, for the first time in 20 years because of uh, CO125. And they ask, how many years can we be in remission for ovarian cancer to be unlikely to recur? I, I know that we all want to hear a, a good answer to that question, but <laughs> I don't know if you can give it. Go ahead, try I always say that the high risk period is the first two years, and once you reach that first two year mark, that's a really, you know, that's a, a great thing because even if the cancer does come back at that point, it's 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 platinum sensitive, um, and then the next big marker is the five year mark. So if the cancer hasn't come back within that five year mark, you know, the risk of the cancer coming back, um, you really does fall off dramatically. Unfortunately, as doctors, there's no way of we can tell who's cancer free. And that's not something we have the ability to do um, at the moment. Maybe in the future we'll have a way. So the best we can do is, um, you know, figure out if somebody's um, still in remission. I think it's important if somebody gets that five-year mark to definitely go on and live their life as best they can, um, and try and, you know, uh, it, it, I know I'm, I'm sure it's very difficult not to have it on the back of your mind all the time. But I think that, you know, it definitely if somebody's reached that five-year mark without the cancer having returned, I think that's really a great landmark. Well, thank you so much, not only for that answer and all your answers, but uh, for uh, your time today and your just the thoroughness and the clarity. Um, I, I think you can hear the thunderous applause coming from ovarian cancer survivors across the nation as they... Uh, as they prepare to take a moment to fill out the survey at the end of this webinar, um, I'm going to remind our, our listeners that they need to click File, Exit, Leave for the survey to download. It'll take you only a minute. It helps us so much. And uh, Dr. O'Carroll, uh, Cher can't thank you enough. We really appreciate your expertise and your time. But I think the most important thing is the women who have you know led to all these developments is, is our patients. So, you know, they, they definitely have to get the number one applause for, you know, being so resilient and heroic through, throughout their disease courses. Because it's, it's tough, but uh, hopefully the, uh, the future is much brighter. Well, thank you, thank you. I think they'll take that compliment and maybe they'll walk a little taller today. <laughs>